Um, so it's not until the British decided to um, get a sense of national identity that then they saw that English could, could, could be a viable language. That's one reason. The other one is the pairs have started recording, right? And then the royalty was like, well, okay, we, have, we really have to speak this language, you know, <laughs> you know, so we can understand what they're saying. Right, so, and so when, when, you look at, when you look at the history of English, the fact that it was seen as vulgar, and then later when you see African languages as vulgar, um, there's a sense of irony there. But now, we think the growth of English, several things happened. You know, you had many Englishes, right? And it had to be standardized, right? You know, so, so you end up with people like um, uh, Samuel Johnson, you know, the dictionary, you know, I think it was 1955, the dictionary of English. You know, that was one of the attempts, you know, one of, one of the major attempts to standardize English. But what then happened was English, once it was standardized, then it became the language of the elite. Um, but there is a term that I find very, very useful. Uh, from a, it's from a, a literary critic called Adam Beach. Um, it talks about the English metaphysical empire. And what he says is that for, for, for people like Samuel Johnson and the other standardizers, for them, they actually looked down upon the idea of the physical empire, right? You know, they didn't understand. Why are you going around colonizing people, blah, 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 taking their land? Why can't you do it through culture? Right? So he argues that for them, what they wanted to see was a British material empire. What they wanted to see was an English metaphysical empire. And when, when you look at English now, it really is, you know, most of us are trapped within the English metaphysical empire. Now, when English now came through colonial education, um, of course, it did not come and say, hey, you know, we used to be inferior, you know, we used to be an inferior language, you know, in fact, we just got standardized, right? <laughs> no, it, it came as a singular, as a singular, as a singular uh, language uh, with authority and, of course, military and, you know, and economic power behind it. Now, what is interesting is how then does English become uh, the language? Of course, there's colonial education, but even amongst colonial education, you had a process they called um, adaptation, right? And this comes from, there are all these interesting linkages. This comes from a, a, an organization that was based in the US called the Helpstones Foundation that was funding studies. And one of the studies said that, well, if you want to educate the native, uh, you need to use adaptation. You know? So don't shock the native into, don't shock the native into civilization. Ease them, you know, so you don't alienate them. You know? so, so the idea was, and this is what now most of us in the 70s grew up with actually, uh, you do like two years of your language or three years of your language and then you switch over to English, right? You know, so the idea was slowly acculturate, right? Acculturate the African, um, you know, but then of course, colonial education, this is the system we've inherited in. So whatever we're seeing today really is what the colonial education was like, where you're getting punished, of course, I said that earlier for speaking English. Um, but then also the idea of African language is being inferior. The idea of African culture has been inferior, religions, and so on and so forth. Right? You know, so the, by, the, by the time of, uh, let me put it this way, because I've, I've, in, uh, most of you will know my dad, we were there as a proponent of writing in African languages, right? So, and I've been very curious about the, the 1962 conference that was done here, right? You know, you know the, 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 the African writers of English expression, right? So I will talk a little bit about that and then you that in soon. But I think we asked him point blank, right? Now tell me, how is it in 1962 you guys couldn't see, because even for him at that point he wasn't advocating for African languages, at that point the idea was you're going to have an African novel in English that's realist. Then you couldn't see and he said no, <laughs> I mean, you know, now when I came across it, I'm like, English metaphysical and I started making sense. If you're already in it, what else can you see, right? Um, so, the 1962 conference is important because that's where now, for the Achebe generation and the Inomeda's generation, that's where the question of languages begins. And it begins with an essay, if you haven't read it, you should, um, an essay called, by Obi Wali, who's a Nigerian critic, he passed away, um, called The Dead End of African Language, of African Literature. So following, and he began, and he began his essay by asking, why is it that people like him also are excluded? And what does it mean that you have named, already you have named your conference writers of English expression, right? You know, what, what does that mean? What, who is being left behind? So at point, he went ahead and argued that, well, um, you know, if you keep writing in, in English, what you're doing actually is you're contributing to, uh, to, to English or European literature, right? 
and he argued that um, that if African literature continues with that trend, it will become an appendage. Right? Um, now, of course, there are counter arguments. This is where now I'm trying to give you just a quick overview of the language question, and then you know, we'll have the Q and A. Um, so, but this is where now Chiba Chebe responds uh, in the essay, the African writer in English, and then he makes the arguments for English, right? And some of the arguments he makes are. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole movement, right, that was lacking for English. You know, and you can break down the arguments in several ways, you know, so it's, it's, it's pragmatism, right? The language is here. Uh, it's a language of power, we need to use it, right? That's one. Um, we, have, we have many ethnicities and many languages. Um, English becomes the language of, of conversation. And he gives the example, in other essay, he gives an example of, uh, you know, reading Shaban Roberts, you know, how would he read Shaban Roberts? What is interesting, <laughs> what is interesting about that period is that they did not see translation as a viable option, right? So he, so he could ask, yeah, how would I read Shaban Roberts' recipe Swahili? Right? And there were people like Ezekiel who actually argued that English can be a language for an African language. Right? And there are reasons why they are making these arguments. And then, so you have that side, and later you have uh, Ken Samangui who are also making that argument for English. And then on the other side, now you have Goge. Uh, Masizi Kunene, uh, Obiwali, uh, and Daniel Kunene. And for them the argument was, you cannot have full decolonization, right, if you're still using the colonial languages. But more than that, the argument was that there is a linkage between language and culture, right? Uh, and an example that, that, I, that, that I like to use for myself is, uh, you know, let's say there's a day in Kikuyu, if you found a day in something, you know, in English, in English you say, I dare you. Uh, but in Kikuyu you say, uh, do this, but you are you to eat right? Now it's just a dare. <laughs> so, so if you translate that into English, you could just say, I dare you. But when you break those words apart, you start seeing that it's connected to Kikuyu or Kikuyu or Kenyan history because it means even those who refused are no longer here, right? Uh, so you might as well do it. But Iregi goes back to the Mamao, you know, the, the 1940s generation of the Mamaos, because that was the Bahia Iregi, that was the generation that refused. So now, if you don't speak Ikuyu, uh, how will you access that history? Right? How, how will you accept it? How will you access it when in, in, in just I, I dare you? Right? So, so for them, they, they argue there's, a, there's an intimate connection between uh, people's memory, culture, and language. Um, now, so for me, what has become interesting, you know, and it's something that I've been talking about nowadays, what, what, what has been the cost? Okay, here we are, you know, I'm writing in English as well, you know, but what has been the cost of um, not seeing beyond the English metaphysical empire? Now, okay, how many of you know of early South African writing, you know, like from the 1880s? People like Thomas Mufolos, Chaka, uh, A.C. Jordan, Tirasa, and Zesla. Are those titles familiar? Now, so there, there was a literary movement, uh, early South African writers, who saw themselves as, as, as a movement uh, who, in fact, become the, the ANC, is one of those intellectuals and writers, right, in 1912. Now, but the model, the model they've been using, they would write in a in, 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 in Crossan, I can the kick for for Yeah! <laughs> you know, they already know in a in Crossan, uh, or, or Zulu, or Soto, and so on and so forth. And then they get translated into English, awesome. which is the normal, which is usually the normal movement of literature. If you think of Swedish literature, you know, one of the popular books, the tattoo dragon thing, right? Uh, it's, first, it's first written in Swedish, you know, and then it does well in, the, in Sweden, and then it gets translated. So for them, they were doing what is normal, right? Um, but you get the 1962 generation, even though people like Ezekiel and Fidel would have been aware of the early South African writers, um, you get for, for the 1962, for the Achebe generation, it's a if, it's a if that literature doesn't exist, right? And what I'm, what I'm working on now is actually comparing, um, doing a three journey, um, you know, a three generation intergenerational analysis of uh, AC Jordan's brother and ancestors, Gino uh, Achebe is no longer at his. And we need new names uh, by Nobel and Pilawayo. And what you find is, this is the most fascinating thing because in the, in, in the early, in that literature that nobody talks about, it's a literature you can say of synthesis, right? It's a literature of hope. It's a literature of, uh, well, you know, 
you know, the white man has come, he looks like he might stay for a while. You know, <laughs> why, why, don't we, why don't we synthesize, right? You know, you, can, you, you get the best of that culture, you get the best of this culture, and then you end up with a, you know, I, you know with a, with a, with a, I guess with a good, you know, complete culture. So, so part, part of it, part of it, reading that now, you can say a bit of the naivety, right? But that was the literature of mass content, right? So, it's, it, that book actually, Jinwa Chepes things fall apart. If you think in terms of literary tradition, it's actually building on A.C. Jordan's uh, The Wrath of Ancestors, right? And then, of course, you have No Violet. You know, so my question, you know, to, to my generation of writers, like, what does it mean, you know, for us uh, to be writing and working in a literary tradition where we don't know of a literary period? You know, imagine British literature if, without romanticism, right? Because, I, I mean, that's pretty, you know, that's pretty much without modernism, you know, which would be closer. You know, what, what does it mean that for us, Having inherited the 1962 mantra of English only, what does it mean for us that we are writing and producing literature with no awareness of a literature that comes before us? Right? Um, so, 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 so the question of, of English is not just innocent. There are some costs, you know, not, not just access to, not just immediate access to our, our history and culture, but also as writers and, and literary traditions are very personal for the imagination, right? You know, um, we. The cost for us has been not to have that immediate, or, or even inherited, you know, even inherited uh, knowledge of the early South African writers. But I want to say something though, because it, 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 there, are, there are many confluences and many factors here, you know, because you have British publishers who came uh, with the goal of helping Africans. You know, the, you know, the Heinemann, the AWS series, they did, they did not think of themselves as exploiters. No, they saw themselves as a, as as, as bringing in a, a publishing model that will make books accessible to Africans, right? But even for them, you have them with the idea of the, the, the African novel should be in English and realist, and then you have the writers who for them the African novel should be English and realist. You know, then you have a population that also sees English as the language of our social mobility, and so on and so on. So, so, so it's, it's not as easy or clear cut or simple as, a, you know, as I'm putting it here. Um, now, let, let me just give you a, a quick rundown of what I think now is happening with, with the question of language. You know, talking, talking with the younger writers, I don't know, like I feel very confident, you know, in, in the younger writers, or just happy, I don't know how to describe it. You know, because it seems to me, and I don't know how true this is, but it seems to me that for them, they're not so much in the English metaphysical empire. Right, for my generation, for those who are, you, you couldn't shrug. You know, for my generation, where how you spoke English determined even your social status. You know, for my generation, the Binyabanga, Chimamanda, and so on and so forth. Um, for us, we are sort of stuck. You know, we would have to fight to get out of it, uh, out of the English metaphysical empire. But it seems to me, for the younger writers, they have a fluidity. You know, right now, Jalanda, Jalanda is organizing, um, you know, an issue on, uh, on, on, uh, on, you know, on, on African language writing, right? Something that, you know, uh, and the, there's neither good or bad, but something that Kwani hasn't done, for example, right? Because Kwani is for my generation. Um, you have more independent publishers who uh, can see the value of African writing in African languages, who can see what should be the normal, right? You know, so, for example, um, Ankara Press from Kasama, it's an imprint from Kasama, it does, uh, talking about sex, it does romance, they have started a romance interest. Oh, I knew I'm bringing sex somehow. <laughs> you know, but um, you know, they, 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 they do a, um, yeah, so, so they have a romance imprint. And when was this year, February 14th, Valentine's Day, they had various writers, like Pina Banga, Billy Kahora, you know, and others, uh, who had written English, uh, and then they had translated. And then, as part of, because we're in the digital, digital, digital age, uh, have the recordings. I read, I read Pina Banga's story in this way. You know, so have, have, have the recording of that, and also the original English text, and also the translation available online, right? You know, so it's movement. Of course, there's a question of why, why are we always moving from English into African languages? Why can't it be the other, the other way around? Um, then the other younger writers, like Richard Ali uh, in the Congo, yeah, in the Congo, yeah, because he's, he's writing in the Kala. Um, I'm trying to, I'm still trying to read her. Oh, really, what she's here. Uh, yeah, she translated a, a, a science fiction story to his way. I'm still trying to read it. You know, <laughs> you know, because it's very, it's, it's very what we used to call punk, very punk, it's very, very, you know, and it seems to be something she just did, you know, as, you know, because it seems to me, it seems to me they're not caught in this whole, 
English metaphysical empire. But I wanted to end by saying two things. One is uh, some of the practical things right, we can do, whether, whether you're writing in English or African languages, and so on and so forth. And one is to support efforts. You know, okay, what I would say is, if you're writing in English, then don't stand in the way of African languages, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's because we take, we take this question very personally to an extent where, uh, you know, we look down upon in African languages or people who are trying to work with. So I would say, if you're writing in English, that's fine. It is still, you're still contributing to the African literary tradition. Uh, but instead of standing in the way you can support, for example, we just started on, um, with this year three from the King Prize, we started a Mabati Kiswahili Prize for African writing. And one of the reasons we decided to call it Mabati Prize for African writing uh, is precisely because of some of the questions we got. Somebody emailed me and said, well, how can a Kiswahili novel be African literature? Right, because it's in Kiswahili. Then my question was, well, like for you, I mean, immediately in your questions, English, no one asked the phrase, you know, is it African literature? Because it just assumed English is the language. So, 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 so the, when something is written in a, now in an African language, it becomes less, right? Uh, <laughs> but, but anyway, um, so, and the whole idea of the Mabati Prize is to award, you know, that it's $15,000 divided by three people uh, with publication by East African educational publishers, uh, and then translation, of course. Uh, into English, and then uh, there's somebody who published the English versions of the of the reading poetry and, uh, and fiction book. Um, what what I've been very interested in is just how little structures there are for African languages, right? And this is where we can all come in, right? Um, okay, first, there are no literary prizes. You know, like, I mean, in English, it's in English. Okay, okay first, the fact that even in English you have like six or seven literary prizes for. 800 million people is ridiculous, right? But even then, it's worse for African languages. There are very, very few uh, prizes for African languages that are major, right? Um, there are some publishers, but the publishers go with the with the British model of Heinemann, where they're more interested in uh, in set books and you know textbook publishing, right? Um, there are no literary agents for African language writing. Like all the things you take for granted, you know, I mean, you can email somebody now, you know, and say, an agent in here, you know, but so all, all these structures, there, there are absolutely no structures for African writing in African languages, and that's where we need to come in. Um, but I want to end by talking about translation, uh, because, you know, as Gogi says, translation is the place where languages meet equally. From the very, very beginning, we should move from the position of linguists which is that all languages are created equal. In the same way, all human beings, you don't say, you know, unless, you know, you have issues, <laughs> but you don't say, hey, I'm a bigger human being than you, you know. You know, we are all created equal, right? That's, that's the assumption. Now we can argue about the practice of it, you know, and, um, you know, racism and sexism and so on and so forth, but at least we do agree we move from the position of all human beings are equal. And there's value in beginning to look, studying your, your thinking about languages with the idea that all languages are created equal. You know, when it's spoken by five people, a million people, a billion people, right? You, know, you just have to move from that position because if you don't, then you start doing what we do naturally, which is to immediately see African languages are less. We talk about, oh uh, yeah, I speak uh, Kikuyu dialect, you know, or indigenous, indigenous languages, or local languages. Like how, <laughs> you know, like what, what do we mean when we say local languages, right? So if, if you don't move from that position already from if you don't move from that position already, you are feeding into the English metaphysical empire. So, but at any rate, my own belief is that there shouldn't be a single African university without a translation center. Uh, because it's only when we start professionalizing translation uh, that the possibilities of, of African languages, for example, speaking to each other. Why can't we have translations between, let's say, Lingala and Kiswahili, right? Um, if we took advantage of the resources we have, most people speak four or five languages, right? Just you know, they're just born speaking those languages. Of course, they're not taught how to read, you know, how to succeed in those languages. But the potential is there. Why can't we have translation centers at Nairobi University or here, you know, at, at Makerere University, and then start fostering the idea that all languages are equal and that you can professionalize African translation, right? And it's only from that then that we start developing African translation theory. Because I believe there's a difference between, let's say, translating between, <coughs> let's say, between English and French. Um, sounds, for example, think of Kiswahili as a Bantu language, right? Kiswahili, uh, Shona, let's say Zulu, 
if you're translating between those two languages or those three languages, the rhythm is almost the same because it's all coming from what is it called the morphology. Anyway, the language structure is the same. So what does that mean, you know, for an African translator, right? Or the politics are already embedded in, in the languages, right? You know, the, and those and those politics are just really familiar. And so on and so on and so forth. But I think it's only when we start professionalizing uh, African literary translation that then we can have uh, we can have African languages speaking to each other, or speaking with English or French or any other language. Uh, let me end there. Let me end there so we can open up the conversation. Thank you. Words in, in, uh, African languages. <coughs> My name is Bernard Tawaii. Um, uh, I used to be a journalist, um, not anymore, so just a good citizen around town. Um, and I like to hang around writers, which is uh, well, yeah. And um, uh, have sort of ask a few questions, and then we'll open it up to um, to the the audience. Um, my question is about uh, having you know, universities having translation centers and things like that, and yet these same governments that are cutting funding to universities, or if you live in a country like Uganda, you have a president that um, wants uh, all the money to go into science, uh, and not certainly things like translation uh, can't come into, into the picture. Maybe, does he have a point when you say, given everything else that we have to to deal with, to support, and we are poor countries, so you have to you know, have priorities. Maybe let's put money in science, education, and not in things like translation. Is this just a question of scarcity of resources, and therefore you have to allocate um, according to your priorities that you say for yourself? I, 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 do, I do think, generally speaking, at least the Kenyan government you know, has been, I don't even want to talk about the whole Kenyan government, you know, but like the Moi government and the, the Jomo Kenyatta's government have been anti African languages, right? You know, that's how they ended up retaining Bogey, uh, you know, because of, uh, of his work with, uh, with Gekoyo, Gekoyo writing, and and and, uh, and the play he did in Kamere, where he was in Gekoyo, right? You know, they were, okay, they were hostile to the idea of having an intellectual, having uh, direct contact, imaginative and otherwise, and political, uh, with, with people, right? You know, because as long as they were writing in English, you know, and they're not being read by the people they're writing for, uh, they were safe, right? It's only, at least for him, it's only when he started writing in, in Gekoyo that uh, the government turned its attention to him. But, but uh, they, for, for everything, we have, to, we have to make arguments for, for it. For example, the idea of ethnic strife in Kenya, right? It's because people don't know each other, right? You know, we don't read each other's, uh, we don't know each other's histories, we don't speak each other's languages. You know, and, as, and the whole idea of sort of leveling, you know, sort of leveling. Like I saw somebody who had written an article in response to my father's visit last week, uh, where he says that um, there are now people don't call themselves by the African names, you know, so, you know, as a way of hiding or, or defeating ethnicity. But then it doesn't work like that. It's actually counterintuitive. The more you know, the more you know your culture, the more secure you are. The more you know other people's culture, the more you know, the, the, the more they become less strangers. So we can make an argument to African governments that if you want peace then allow the people to speak to each other through, you know, through African languages. Uh, I, I wonder what you, you, who would Sheng, with a language like Sheng qualify as an African language? Because also the use of language and how language develops and yeah, evolves is, is quite interesting. And again, Kenya yeah. provides a very interesting example. And just about how many people in Kenya speak Sheng, for example. And maybe you could just explain what Sheng is. Yeah, Sheng. Yeah, I, I, I was never able to speak Sheng even when I was in Kenya. You know, but, um, but Sheng is a mixture of Swahili and English, right? The question is, does it meet the definition of a, of a language, which is it has a re repeatable, you know, re repeatable laws? You know, because for example, in Bonnets, uh, in, in what people call Black American English, it is a language because it has a structure that's re repeatable. Now, does Sheng have that, that structure? If it does, then I'll say yes, it qualifies. I mean, language is broke, right? If it doesn't, then, well, then, then it doesn't, you know? I don't know who, does anybody speak Sheng here? <laughs> so does, does, does it have a, like a regular grammar that's repeatable? Yeah, then if it does, then it's a language. <laughs> All right. Um, you also spoke about, uh, and I'm not saying that to be hip. <laughs> You spoke about uh, you know what uh, Jalada the collective is, is, is doing. Um, 
or uh, you mentioned somebody, uh, Ali from DR Congo. Do you see this as just, you know, something that is cool for young people to be doing, you know, um, we've had debates for 40 plus years, let's do something. Is this something you see across the continent or is this just, you know, a few isolated examples, possibly they will die out sooner rather than later? Because I, I think the generally African writers have always had a pan African consciousness. They are aware of each other, whether we agree we would call ourselves African writers or not. In practice, in practice, we have been pan African. I mean, like here, we are all from all over the continent, right? Um, you know, it's, I, I believe this is the same thing with the Jalaka Collective, right? It's a, it, people from different, you know, it's not just Kenyans, I think it's Congolese, and, and Moses can speak to it more. But it seems to me they already have a pan African consciousness um, about their work. But more than that, I would like to believe that there's a hunger they have, which is, well, I mean, okay, as a writer, how, how can we be writers who don't know our literary tradition? You know, like, it, it just, I don't know, to me, I, I feel like, um, like it's almost walking without one leg, right? It's so I like to believe that, even though they themselves may not articulate it that way, that what's leading them into, in, in, into the African languages is, is, is that desire to own, and know their literary tradition. And uh, where's the debate at actually right now? Uh, 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 there are even those, because you said even if you're writing English or French, you shouldn't stand in the way of yeah. African languages. But, so is there an awareness, is there of the importance of writing in African languages, or at least attempting to do so? Yeah. Do you see that amongst uh, people involved in cultural production like yourself? I, I, I think so. I, I, I think the debate has largely shifted. Actually, you know, you know, in the '60s it was uh, we can Africanize English. You know, that was you know, you know, the whole use of proverbs and so on and so forth. And then you have the other side that say don't write in English. You know, I, I think now, now, now there's more fluidity. I think there's more give, right? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm optimistic. You know, we need we need literary scholars to study this. You know. Um, but if you're talking about Ankara Press, you know, having this the Pan African network, you know, all of them writing stories and then they're getting translated. You're talking about Jalada, you're talking about uh, people who are doing translations and so on and so forth. And I, I think the debate has shifted. Uh, and what are the long term implications, actually, people just find it too, too difficult? You can attempt and then just find it too hard to operate. Uh, because you say there are no structures, but also, uh, I think people write, they want to you know, live a better life, make some money, and but if I'm going to write, say, in Uganda, then wait for somebody to translate into English, reach a larger market, and that's just a lot of work. I need to sell yeah, my book real quick really and make money. Yeah, but it's like practical like, considerations. It, like, I think when my dad's uh, Devil on the Cross came out in Kikuyu, he sold like 7,000 copies, right? And eventually, you know, you could argue he was better known and so on and so forth. Um, but let's be frank, you know, the, the books were written in English, how many copies are we selling anyway? You know what I mean? If you, when you look at your royalty statement, you know, <laughs> for most of us, right? You know, for most of us, you're selling 100, 700, 1,000. If you're doing really, really well, you're selling 2,000. Why is it that we value that 2,000 people more than the 2,000 people in our own, who speak our own languages, right? You, you know, there, there are ways in which we value Okay, so, so if I was read by 2,000 Kenyans, why should that be less important than, you know, uh, than being read by 2,000, you know, uh, Europeans, for example, right? <laughs> Isn't it? Well, no, 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 but they're buying, I mean, the, 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 the 2,000 Kenyans are buying the books, I'm getting the same royalties, 12 point something, right? In the same way, I'm getting the same amount of money from, uh, from the 2,000. You know, look, it, 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 what we need to do really is think about the structures. Because, okay, you're right. Uh, if you write a book in Uganda, who's going to publish it, right? Um, you know, to give you a, an example, my father has like seven manuscripts in Gekoyo that his publisher won't touch, right? Um, you know, so, so no, we, we just have to set up the structures, you know. Now, what I find interesting is it's only the intellectuals, it's only us, the intellectuals, where this is a big issue. Musicians, you know, sing, sing, sing in their languages, you know, and they will sing in English as well, and like Kiswahili. Uh, pretty much all other cultural producers uh, have no problems, you know. Um, it's only with the intellectuals where it becomes an issue. Uh, all right, uh, uh, literature is obviously important for language, uh, long term. But so if there isn't, um, if we don't see uh, going forward as much 
uh, writing in African languages, what, what will happen, say, uh, 500 years from now? I think these languages will die out. Is there some real, real cost to culture, heritage? Yeah. Well, if, 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 if you don't have people writing in the language, right, and you don't have literary scholars also responding in that language, uh, then there are ways in which the language will ossify, right? Um, for example, you know, uh, Chimamanda that, that gives a very interesting interview where she talks about um, why she writes in, um, in English. And she says the same thing I say, you know, we have through this educational system uh, that divorced us from that language. Then I believe she wanted to do something intellectual. You know, I, I think most writers, most African writers will say, oh, I can write poetry in my language, but not, um, you know, philosophy or a novel and so on and so forth. Um, so there, there is that danger, but I, I we just have to jump in, I think. All right, um, let me uh, hear from the audience. Just put up your question, and if you're loud enough, ask from where you are. If you're not, then you can come to the microphone. Yes. Yeah, I just um, actually was making a few notes. Uh, um, one of the things you mentioned was that uh, prioritization of sciences uh, that uh, the president of Uganda mentioned. And I just wanted to say that I think it's so problematic for me because we know of 16th century England because of William Shakespeare, who was an artist. We know uh, every child soldier on this continent knows Rambo, you know? So when we decide that we, the history of a nation is actually written through its arts. The sciences are also very important, but when you decide that you're going to discard one over the other, it's very problematic. Um, and Nkoma, in your address, I like that you mentioned um, uh, which is The Wrath of the Ancestors by A.C. Jordan. And that came out in the early 30s, I think. Yeah, but only translated in 1960. Yeah, by his wife. Yeah. Uh, but what's interesting is there was also the first book in South Africa by a black writer was actually in English and it was 1910 and it's called Nubi by Saul Kapan. That said, I always think that there's a room for languages to be, you know, the English language and African languages to work comfortably around each other. One of the things that I absolutely love about uh, Nigerian literature is how they have taken the English language and just Africanized it in such an amazing way. You know, when you read that, every African here understands when you read a book by a, natu a, a Nigerian writer, you, you talk of, they talk about hearing the smell. It, 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 it's something that only Africans understand, you know, like kill your dead, hearing the smell, that type of thing. And I like that about it. Uh, but I'm saying there's room for both. And one of the things that really bothers me is that every university on this continent has a language department. I don't understand why it's not a requirement, you know, for maybe somebody who's earning a master's degree to have to translate a book from either English to Kalenjin or Kalenjin to English, from, you know, Luganda to English, English to Luganda, so that people are able to access this material on a greater way, in a greater way. Yeah, my response would be that, um so the South African model, right, it, it, you know, and there's also the Pilgrim's Progress, the, the guy wrote a similar book. Um, uh, anyway, the South African model was the normal model, right? It, it, that's how literature develops. You know, you'd have, yeah, you'd have people writing in English and their books getting read, published in English. But then they also had a large chunk of writers writing in, uh, in, in South African languages and then getting translated. Right, that, that's, that, that's a normal. That's, that should have been the normal progress. The question becomes, why, why did that? Because I, I like to think of the 1962 generation as a tsunami. Like, how, how is it possible, or how did it happen, that you have this generation that came and completely, you know, erased, you know, or sub suppressed, or whatever term you want to use, the early South African writing? Because that, 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 you know, that, it was the right model, right? You know, writing, writing any language, think about translation, right? Uh, you know, now, to be fair, some of the books that were written, like there's this book called The Traveler, written in the late 1800s uh, by a South African. Uh, it, 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 I have the title if you're interested in this. Uh, but uh, it begins like this. Before the white man came, 
and we were savages eating each other. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so at some level you can see why the, the, the more radical political 1962 generation wouldn't want anything to do with that. The, the question becomes, why is it that literary critics uh, don't pay attention to that and start looking at the continuities, right? Now, the further irony is that um, Actually, it's Western. It's actually Western early critics like uh, the German Jan Hansen, you know, um, that actually would start African literature from Afro-Arab writing. You know, if you, there are more survey books, but if you look at them, it was natural to begin uh, African literature. And at the farthest point, they could go back. So, and then they would start with the Afro-Arabs, and then um, you know, come come to the come, then come to the um, to early slave narratives. Because why not? Why can't we think of uh, Eludo Iguiano's uh, memoir? As a first African memoir, it's, it's, it's about a memory of Africa. Why, why, why do we always start? Um, why do we always start the African literary clock in 1962? But anyway, for those guys, it was that was a natural thing to do. You know, why, why, why has African literary critics also bought into the myth of beginning with Achebe, or when the most generous name was Totiola, and when the most you know what they say actually? Uh, they call it the oral literate interface, right? <laughs> you know, so always, so always, it's um, we wrote we we are orator. And then uh, you have to also Tiola who becomes part of the interface, and then you have to watch it. I don't know. I don't get it actually. I, I don't understand how I've gone through my whole life, have a PhD uh, in post-colonial literature, uh, and until recently, even I started the African literary clock with that, with that whole uh, oral literary interface. Like, what what kind of failure is that in literary criticism? Good question. A uh, little factor with the uh, 62 conference was actually held in June, and this is June, so. Uh, <laughs> let's have the gentleman over there, and you, you, you. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. I have a quick question. Louder. Louder. Yeah, slowly, my, my voice will, will come out. <laughs> okay, I, I, I'm wondering, I'm wondering about what, what is to be African without English or French? Can we speak each other? I'm from Ethiopia and I speak Amharic. I read Amharic and we have lots of written Amharic language. So what, what does it mean to be African? Nobody reads Ethiopian literature. Even you didn't mention any. Why? Yeah, no, no, I, 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 everything, yeah. everything. <laughs> I'm not saying, I'm not defending the Ethiopian exceptionalism, but I am saying, the question, what I want to address is, how can we be African? How can we decolonize or, or, or uh, destabilize the English uh, metaphysical empire that you mentioned without having one language together to speak each other, to read each other? Yeah, first, yes, I know. So uh, actually, the, uh, the, uh, uh, actually the early, the, those critics I talked about, like Ian Heinzen, they also, uh, have, they also had a set of Amharic literature. Right, you know, so, so for them really, you know, and if you can find it, it's called Neo, Neo African Literature by Anne Haynes, you know, and it, it gives, they, they were very thorough, let me put it that way. Now, there's nothing wrong with English, right? There's nothing wrong with us speaking English here. There's nothing wrong with us using English as a tool, right? Uh, in the same way, if you're Swedish, you know, most Swedish people are bilingual, they speak Swedish and they speak English, you know, um, you know, Germans and so on and so forth, you know, but but they pay attention to their own languages. So there's nothing wrong with us using English. Uh, there's nothing wrong with, wrong with us, for those who speak Israeli, using Israeli. Uh, there's nothing wrong either with, if I, if I, if, if, uh, if I only speak Amharic, and I'm, I'm a Amharic writer, getting a translator. In the same way, like when I go to, when I go to Germany, because my book was translated there, um, there's a translator, right? You know, like we expect translations for European languages, but not African language. Why can't we have, let's say I only write in Kikuyu, come and speak in Kikuyu and read in Kikuyu and have a translation. It's a bit tedious, but that's what every other people do. Right. So, so we, can use, we can use English as a tool, uh, but we can also think of translation. It, it's essentially we need to begin from that simple principle of all languages are equal, and if they are, they are equal, then what we allow for European languages, then we should allow for African languages. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, the language is adapt, right? You know, the, the, the funny thing is, um, people, I mentioned Samuel Johnson earlier, right? You know, and if you guys are interested in these questions, you know, 
Johnson. Just Google Samuel, Samuel Johnson preface to the 17 something something dictionary, right? You know, because you'll see his rationale. But for him, he had a translation, you know, because he said that a translation will bring in new words. You know, but for us, language is learned, you know. Uh, think of all the Arabic words, for example, in this way, you think, but, you know, that word, that a word is used, it comes in, and then it's adapted, you know. Now, and this is where our questions begin, you know, you have people who are purists who will say, for example, don't say Jiku, you don't say, you know, computer, right? But, but really use the language people are using. So computer has already been co-opted, mm -hmm. right? You know, so, 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 so the languages, languages, languages are always hungry, let me put it that way, yeah. Um, I'll just ask one, two short ones. The, Uganda is a very bad uh, newspaper market, you know, stagnating cells and, you know, cells dropping it. But there has been one paper that um, has grown quite, quite very, done very well in the last maybe five, six, seven years, and that's Moket. It's written in Uganda. Uh, you can take issue with the content and all of that, but yeah. this is a local, uh, um, sorry, a newspaper published, I have to be politically correct, not to say local language, I should say, in an African language, and it's doing phenomenally well compared to the, um, the newspapers written in the ink and which have been around for much. Does that, does that say anything to you? Or yeah, no, it does. It, it, it means if, if, if you write, okay, first I think, and we were talking with, with Zooks earlier, but you know, the myth of, of uh, the Africans don't read, right? It's because we give them the wrong language. I mean, <laughs> you know, so anybody, first anybody who can read the Bible uh, in, in an African language, of course, can read another book. But, anyway, but, but that to me tells me that if you use the people's language, you know, it, if you look at the, actually the early debate of English, right? It's very interesting for us because uh, you have people like William Woodsworth, you know, who, are, who call for the language of men, right? You're saying, you know, speak the language or writing the language of the people are using. Now, for him, he was coming from an elitist point, you know, but at any rate, there was a bit of the argument, right? So yeah, so you a newspaper in Uganda, people who speak Uganda will read it, and they'll, they'll recognize themselves in it. And very well, lastly, uh, you think, uh, what do you make of the Mobutu approach? You know, that whole authenticity thing and requiring people to speak Lingala, you know, basically by fiat, uh, imposing yeah. uh, a national language and yeah. it doesn't have, it doesn't seem to have worked out badly. Well, yeah, but uh, well, okay, so what happens I think in those situations, take an example of South Africa, right, uh, where the whole thing about, about Bantu education was actually a way of defeating, uh, defeating nationalism, right, and hence actually a lot of South Africans ironically then would argue that not, even, even Kenyans as well, you know, but, um, they would say no, we want the English, you know, because because you know that your languages are being used against you, right? Um, I, I don't. I don't think you should force people. I, I, there's no need. First, there's no need. Who, you know? Yeah. Just, okay. Let's okay. Let's go back a little bit. When um, Lenin uh, was writing about, uh, he has an essay called on the on nationalities question and stuff like that, right? And his argument was, you let people join your nation willingly, right? You know, so for example, what we've done in Somalia, you know, divided, divided up Somalia, you know, and when they want to agree to Somalia, we stop them, right? It, 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 you, you, you can't force people to live together, right? And you can't force people to speak a language. I, I think in the long run, um, maybe worked in spite of the Mobutu. <laughs> uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Mokom. Round of applause for...